lenoe falconer a biographical sketch by evelyn march phillips this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales novels and short stories shower upon us like snowflakes in a blizzard many of them excellent in quality fresh and amusing then they pass to give place to others as good and as ephemeral what is the secret which enables one here and there to stand out above the crowd and abide the test of time why is it that mademoiselle x is still going into new editions and men and women still grow enthusiastic over cecilia de noel it is such a small sum of achievement this little handful of volumes yet good judges believe that the little books will become classics when they appeared there seemed every prospect that they would be the heralds of a long line the brilliant solid work the excellence of form the wealth of observation they displayed seemed earnest of a deep well-spring but the hopes raised were never fulfilled and when marie elizabeth hawker to give lenoe falconer her real name passed away in june nineteen o eight in fourteen years she had only added one small volume to her writings literary work hides many tragedies and among the saddest must be the discovery that ill health has blighted the roots of the mind and that the power of creation has become too fierce an effort for the delicate organization little was known of marie hawker in her lifetime outside her immediate circle of friends but these recollect her as a unique personality in her was united the most brimming humour with a sensitive and pathetic melancholy in her youth she was a creature running over with fun and high spirits there lies before me the manuscript of a family chronicle such as many households of young people have produced the laughter in it is so fresh and gay that one is carried along from page to page of the small neat handwriting by an irresistible tide of drollery from the grandiloquent leaders to the paragraphs of mr philip bosch whose task it is to pad corners a witty turn is given to the most prosaic incidents the pet dog a new bonnet no trifle is too slight to awaken merriment in the young girl in her twenties marie was the granddaughter of colonel peter hawker whose instructions to young sportsmen is still read by those who hunt and shoot for the wisdom it contains and by other people for the pleasure of its literary quality some of her early years were spent with her family in france and no doubt her mastery of french and the taste she acquired for reading it had an effect in forming her clear incisive style but most of her life was passed in that hampshire valley which she has described so often and with so loving a touch a calm sleepy village with its church and park and small quiet neighbourhood certain advantages she had freedom from pecuniary worries among them though money was never plentiful the comfortable household had not to think too closely of ways and means hurstbourne park was within a mile of hurstbourne priors where the hawkers lived and in lady portsmouth and her daughters marie found her closest and most congenial friends no one who recalls the wide sympathies the enthusiastic outlook on life which distinguished evelyn lady portsmouth or the cultured personality and delicate incisive judgment of lady camilla wallop afterwards lady camilla gordon will say that this was a superficial factor in her education quietly as she lived she saw english society at its best and the shades of difference with which she draws the county lady the vicar's wife or the fashionable butterfly were the fruit of experience thoroughly imbibed it is surprising to find that she was past forty before anything beyond a few magazine articles appeared from her pen but her work when it appeared was no product of chance from very early days she studied her craft closely she read and wrote and pruned and polished volumes of manuscript books filled with extracts and criticisms bear witness to an industry that never flagged 
one of these chronicles the weather from day to day the changes of the sky the winter fields the hot summer evening another reports snatches of conversation verbatim or records the feelings with which she looked on the face of a dead villager or took part in the humours of a parish meeting she worked on for her own satisfaction developing a higher ideal and greater finish of execution but though she had a wish to write she had no connections with the literary world and no one to urge her to any strong effort when she wrote mademoiselle x she had never even known a russian a strain of music first awoke the keen sympathy which inspired the story marie hawker's own music was very remarkable she had not only an excellent and practised technique but she possessed in marked degree the power of arousing feeling by her playing she heard a russian air played upon the zither she describes it in mademoiselle x the spirit thus revealed was anguish that cannot rest torment that sees no outlet on earth no comfort in heaven the shadow of an unrighteous and pitiless dominion in which the hope of generations has fainted and their faith had waxed dim how terrible she felt must be the national experience of which such a folkslied was the outcome it sent her to the writings of turgenev and stepniak in her diaries still lie newspaper cuttings with descriptions of barbarities practised upon russian prisoners the liberal principles which were hers by tradition expressed also the bent of her nature and it was out of the fullness of her heart that this chord evoked by la grande et triste symphonie de la terre russe was sounded from the peace and safety of her happy english home the novel was of an awkward length and for this reason and also because she had no knowledge of how to set her wares before publishers it was long in meeting with a welcome a letter lies before me in which a writer who is still one of our foremost critics declares that mademoiselle Ix will not suit any one he knows she is too violent a lady it is not the style but the substance that goes against it the appearance of the manuscript itself as it travelled to one publishing firm after another growing brown and tattered was enough to condemn it and yet she could say to that sister who was her dearest confidant i feel it is good and when at last hope was almost crushed it was not so much the failure of her story that vexed her as the fear that perhaps after all her judgment and her perception were radically at fault i will send it once more she said and that shall be the last time it went to mr fisher unwin who recognized the intense vitality of its character drawing and would not risk injuring it by having it lengthened he was inspired to create an issue to suit it in the year eighteen ninety it inaugurated the pseudonym library and seldom has a publisher's foresight been more amply rewarded the pseudonym behind which marie hawker sheltered herself was derived from her father's name lanoi while falconer is of course a paraphrase of the family name the appearance of the little volume was awaited with chastened expectations but its success was instant the reviews were almost unanimous in its favour but the public seemed even before the reviews mr gladstone was among the first to recognize its merits and his appreciation expressed in print called immediate attention to it every one was reading it asking for it at the libraries buying it waiting impatiently while fresh impressions were being printed people on all sides were telling me to read her writes lady camilla gurdon my booksellers delaying till yesterday afternoon to send her to me because she was out of print it is so pleasant to think of your book being snatched up and read by every one as it ought to be i cannot tell you what a delight your success is to me the description of my darling hurstbourne went straight to my heart and gave me a thrill of heimweh an old friend writes it recalls a wonderful letter that you wrote to me when you were a child of a journey you took you described so vividly and minutely the incidents that happened that i kept it for years 
the welcome accorded to mademoiselle x was received with exultation and delight by marie's devoted family and with unaffected pleasure and relief by herself two things she most coveted were granted her french and russian recognition madame darmester sent her a warm message of praise from m taine and afterwards wrote again to assure her that if she came to paris she would be received with great pleasure by the many persons already familiar with mademoiselle x and find herself at once in the midst of all that was choicest in the world of letters the russian tribute came in a different form a friend sent her a copy which had been recovered from the censor's hands page after page was blacked out and finally the word that showed it was tabooed was scored across the whole volume here says sir arthur quiller couch in reviewing the book we have a new writer filled with love of her fellow beings to him the earlier pages stand so much on the level of ordinary life that the catastrophe does not come into the same plane but we submit that that is just what this kind of tragedy involves in one moment all the bright domestic life is shattered by a pistol shot and from the rooted calm of the english household and its gaieties we come face to face with the deep despair of a nation the only thing we cannot believe is that such a capable cool-headed person as mrs merriman's russian governess would not have killed her man it is a book one cannot read without a sense of its power and reserve force so many qualities are shut in so small a space the humour and pathos never fail to move however often one reads it we recognise its exquisite workmanship and its outlook on life so quiet so stern yet tender what a cipher what a puppet the young girl of the story would have remained in many hands but here evelyn with her true pure fearless character deepening under the influence of a sterner nature and of an insight into the tragedy of life convinces us perhaps more than anything in the book of its author's genuine creative power before mademoiselle x appeared the book which marie hawker called her own child cecilia de noel was already in the hands of messrs macmillan placed there by miss gertrude ireland blackburn who upon the manuscript being shown her by miss hawker exclaimed at once this is pure gold the head of the house of macmillan was not behind her in his appreciation there is no question he writes of the talent of the book whether the public will recognize it as quickly as it should do i do not feel certain but if they fail to do so it will be to their own blame and no fault of the book itself the public did not fail and cecilia de noel very much enhanced marie hawker's position it was not so instantly popular as its predecessor it was less light and needed closer application to appreciate but the discussion and interest it aroused were widespread and lasting it is it will be remembered a tale of a few days spent in a country house which is haunted by a very terrible ghost which impresses those who see it as being a lost soul the book tells the impression the ghost made on seven different people out of deference to the author's admirable handling we find ourselves assenting to the ghost she never attempts to explain it in fact we are left in some doubt as to whether there is really any ghost at all or if the frank unbeliever in the story is right when he asserts that it only appeared to those people who were expecting to see it for the interest does not lie in the ghost but in the effect it produces on one after another of the people it visits with a satire that is always easy kindly and in the best sense urbane a satire that does not mar but rather emphasizes the tenderness of feeling you are let into the religious and non-religious conceptions of these characters and so you get atherley's gospel and mrs molyneux's gospel and canon verdane's gospel and the rest till you come to the gospel of cecilia de noel herself the scientist the sceptic the evangelical the sleek self-confident cleric 
the ascetic young ritualist the fine lady fattest all see the ghost in turn and all in turn have their complacency shaken their rags torn from them their dread of the unseen emphasized yet no one neither priest nor layman nor woman is inspired with any spark of pity for a kindred spirit doomed to everlasting woe in each case the visionary thinks only of his own soul and of guarding or rescuing it it is not till cecilia appears on the scene that the attitude is changed what if the spirit came longing for help and forgiveness how earnestly she prayed that if it appeared to her she might forget all selfish fear and have strength and wisdom to give it help if the last chapter does not take the reader by the throat says one of its reviewers i am inclined to pity him an almost flawless gem the editor of the new review writes to her perfect alike in conception and realization i have rarely read anything in which the sentiment is so deep and true without being mawkish it is welling over with the best spirit of the age you have not written a ghost story writes a friend but a story which is a ghost in itself not the actions of men and women but their spirits moving about in worlds not realized form the theme and one can trace the ignorance incredulity awe and hope with which they severally turn to the unseen mr h was here last night writes lady camilla he has been reading cecilia and he said that book has been a baptism to me i told him of your having said it contained your gospel and was the message you had to give to the world and he said yes the book is just that a message to the world mr r h hutton can he be the mr h mentioned canon ainsworth and many preachers took it as a book to be thought over illustrating how all revelation is a manifestation of personality the veiled truth that in love spirit speaks to spirit man speaks to man but how account for that love in man how account for that other love that is able to speak to and relieve the sorrow of the world the following letter from mr j h shortus author of john inglesant is among her papers Quote, may fourteen eighteen ninety two as i sat in the cathedral salisbury this morning my mind was full of consoling certainty that the veil that separates free thought and revelation is of the thinnest texture and would vanish utterly away but for the miserable faculty we have of misunderstanding one another and the still more appalling determination so common among so-called religious people that having received the unspeakable gift themselves god shall not manifest himself to any other man in any other way i think faith cannot be defined as anything belonging to mere assent in a dogma or submission to authority faith must relate to idea this is the ideal truth which underlies the dogma and gives it its power and vitality two considerations seem to me to follow from this statement first that it is a certain fact that in all history the source of faith so defined is free thought this was most strikingly the case in the history of the founder of christianity second there is not a single dogma of christianity however strange and wild it may appear but has some germ and basis of the true idea take eternal punishment for instance as perhaps the most extreme this seems nothing but a somewhat popular way of stating the undoubted fact of the pitiless sequence of conditional existence take the trinity again the christian doctrine of the eternal son seemingly so strange is nothing but the platonic doctrine of the idea and personality existing in the mind of god then with regard to your own beautiful words and pleading for the sympathy of humanity we must remember who it was who said this is the first and great commandment to love god and the second is like unto it to love thy neighbour as thyself on these two commandments hang all the law of the universe and all the insight of the seers and the same who said this was the first 
who in the whole world's history reclaimed by kindness a woman who was a sinner is there no allegiance due in the day of conflicting voices to such a teacher as this End quote. the deep and touching sentiment the speculative discussions which form the basis of the book are lit up and relieved by the humour which plays all through it it is a humour which is almost too elusive for quotation miss hawker's personages have nothing to say in epigrams they are not the sort of people who know themselves to be amusing and have to live up to a reputation for saying smart things nor are they observed and described with anything verging on the spiteful perhaps the commonest fault in woman's wit her work has the inevitable quality it represents everyday people as seen by a humorously attentive eye and it has all the breadth and geniality characteristic of true humour charming prosaic lady atherley only aroused by the alarming tirade of her low church neighbour against the romish tendencies of the new curate into a speculation as to whether he is an austin of rude austin in which case he ought to be asked to dinner or placidly looking up from her knitting to beg another high-flown guest to defer her drastic strictures on the christian faith because the servants are just bringing in coffee and might think it odd is near akin to lady bertram with her do not act anything improper my dears sir thomas would not like it and the canon and lucinda and mr mostyn and the children and atherley himself a man's man as he has been called stand with the vicar's wife in mademoiselle x and with colonel and mrs graham in the violin obligato all drawn with such light touches always in the right place mr fisher unwin soon brought out the hotel d'angleterre and other stories a collection which well maintained the writer's reputation in fact some people think the violin obligato is the best thing she ever wrote it is full of delicate shades of feeling the love affair of the commonplace superficial couple acting with such reflected force upon the sensitive nature of the one who only looks on is told with a delightful mingling of pathos and drollery what i am longing for is that you should publish some of those stories of old hampshire folk which you tell so inimitably writes lady camilla gurdon and later on appeared the tiny volume of old hampshire vignettes so slight yet bringing as her friend says the sound and scent of the water meadows and the vision of the beloved county and its people as nothing else and above all no one else could do her grip on her characters is very tight and not only those who knew and loved the scenes she describes realized the actors in them as living men and women fame and recompense seemed within her grasp from all quarters came requests for stories from america an offer of two hundred and fifty pounds for a short story to be published in an exclusive series which included such names as kipling barry and marion crawford but it was not to be health failed rapidly and with it the power to bring creative work up to that high standard she had always before her from the age of nineteen she had suffered from internal catarrh and as time went on she became the prey of a distressing form of dyspepsia yet she continued to write she has left a whole volume of ideas for short stories diaries which describe life from day to day and afford a subtle analysis of her own feelings and impulses there is little record of intercourse with writers of the day but it is impossible to help smiling as marie must have done herself over a passage with miss young in spite of the opinion of the author of the heir of redcliffe that it was a pity that so fine a book as cecilia de noel should be injured by the entire absence of christianity marie had been pressed to contribute a story to the christmas number of the monthly packet miss young's special organ the story turned on the happy marriage of an english girl with an italian an innocent subject it would appear on the surface but miss young who did not always include a sense of humour among her many distinguished attributes sets forth the difficulty arising Quote, 
i endorsed a strong remonstrance in mothers in council against english girls marrying italians as representing much misery which the author knew only too well to be the consequence and to adopt a story where this is the happy conclusion seems to me inconsistent and that i know that altering does not answer and that it would destroy the point of your tale i should have liked margaret six years after to have seen her lover fat and unromantic and the doleful state of an englishwoman in the castle by the sea and to be very thankful to her good father End quote. if miss young would only carry out her views as to what ought to be the end of the story as explained in her letter to me exclaims marie to the editor it would make an entertaining paragraph i have never met any one with so high pitched a standard it seems almost incredible that the story appeared with a footnote disclaiming miss young's responsibility for its opinions we must try to give some idea of marie hawker's personality what was she like when she came into a room says one of her closest friends and answers you saw a woman with a plain face but an attractive face a slight undeveloped figure dressed in an old maidish way inappreciative of current fashion her hair was soft and dark her skin white her eyes were great short-sighted gray eyes full of gleams of light her wonderful smile was a very striking trait she had beautiful teeth strong white and regular they were her one small vanity and the consciousness of their perfection seemed to give confidence to her laugh her hands too were beautiful and she used them eloquently when at her ease that she was badly dressed was often due to the fact that she was employing some failure as dressmaker to whom no one else would give work for a whole winter after her home was broken up she lived in one room to save money to set up a needy workwoman in a business in which she promptly failed i can see she is all wrong marie would say plaintively she bulges out and goes in at the wrong places but in spite of these disadvantages she was extremely dainty and precise in her attire and arrangements and her own plain needlework and knitting had the same sort of perfection that marked her writing there was something early victorian about her consideration and courtesy strangers were apt to make her shy and awkward lionizing was distasteful to her and she was not a success at london parties but with those she loved she was gay and expansive her speaking face seemed to express her thoughts before her soft sympathetic voice uttered them she was the best of company telling a story admirably and writing delightful letters her range of interests was very wide her great pleasure says one of her friends was to pass into speculations social and religious we often read the same book in order to discuss it another speaks of the intense impression made by the spirituality of her nature and of the great depth of her character at one time her tongue and temper were quick but she gained absolute control over both with all her keen sense of the ridiculous her loving sympathy and power of imagination gave her a horror of paining others by sarcasm and she dreaded anything that verged on the bumptious or dictatorial she would talk about music ideas other people's work but it was difficult to make her talk about her own can a person be very reserved and yet very transparent asked the one who knew her best then that was marie her simplicity and high-minded sincerity shined through every page of her diaries which she went on with when ill and depressed sometimes as an outlet sometimes with the hope that her experience might prove to be of use to others she was saved from pessimism by that strong religious feeling which grew more pronounced as years went on till the spiritual side of life was more real to her than any other some would have called her unorthodox yet she never thought of herself as other than a faithful member of the church of england home life was not without its trials 
her mother had married again while her children were still young and their stepfather was not altogether an easy person to live with mr dacre and colonel graham give us some insight into peculiarities which only a source of entertainment in high-spirited youth become irksome to the delicate overstrung woman a domineering temper directed against a dearly loved mother affected the daughter more than it did the wife who seems to have understood her husband and to have discounted his tiresome ways after the manner of married people her mother's long illness and death was a time of great suffering indeed the sense of loss and bereavement ended only with her own life the old home was broken up and though much time was spent with her married sister she lived off and on for some time at winchester the failure of the digestive organs led to her almost giving up food and it was no wonder that the doctors pronounced her brain to be starved my brain feels wooden she would say the end was due to rapid consumption she had put off going to her sister's house till well on into the summer thinking that herefordshire would be too cold when she at length arrived to her sister's surprise and grief she found herself greeting a dying woman and a few weeks of utter collapse saw the end her last illness was marked by the same tender and courteous consideration for others which had distinguished her life when taking the food ordered brought on deadly nausea she would rouse herself to say here comes my kind nurse always bringing me something good and all the little trials of great weakness were borne with unfailing patience she was just sixty when she died but it was difficult not to believe her much younger not only was she alert and bright but her mind and her outlook upon life were so far removed from those of age some of her diary is mournful reading enough yet not altogether sad for the brave spirit of faith and patience never fails Quote, we all have our halcyon days when we are in tune with the fundamental note exquisite moments the douceurs of the mystic writers the rainbow the dawn the sunset and like these the consequence and handiwork of immutable laws the art of living successfully with others like most other arts depends chiefly on the art of omission by restricting our words and actions or let us say words for actions are of comparatively little importance the chief offences would be avoided the first thing needful is to learn to be quiet it is the foundation for self-command of all kinds the first step to speaking well is to know how to keep silent in this way it comes at last to the ego itself and not the body or the temperament which conducts our share of the conversation to say the right thing at the right moment to the right person is perfection yet on the lower and more accessible step of not saying the wrong thing we may attain to that real courtesy of which popularity is the acknowledgments perhaps she was thinking of the characters in the violin obligato when she wrote quote, that actual life should be full of idols romances poems is not so wonderful but what surprises me is that the leading roles in some of the most moving dramas are often filled by actors so essentially prosaic and commonplace when viewed from close at hand it is not always the artistic people who play the parts they could appreciate or describe the people who watch the spectacle of life are always fewer in number as modern life leaves less leisure for watching anything and still fewer the spectators who not only watch but discriminate with the admiration of a cultivated taste for so much that the uninitiated neither notice nor appreciate all these in nine cases out of ten must resign themselves to be lonely they are of the stuff of which are made poets whether in prose or verse and though they may not themselves be articulate poets they bear the penalty of being highly connected in suffering the inevitable disabilities of their illustrious kin it is not only in the mechanical arts that special trades have their special ailments for the idealist living wholly with people occupied with the concrete 
existence is not merely lonely but fatiguing it is as though he or she were forever talking a foreign language oh the rest as well as the joy to be able for a little to speak our native tongue does she come from my own country was lady g s way of putting it to camilla probably lady g was of a different type from the writer and came from a different country but she expressed the same craving for the bent of her own tastes and instincts after reading huxley's life i end with the strong impression of a soul not perishing but famished for the divine he was one of those who can be satisfied with nothing less the sadness of this unconfessed craving is to be read in his portrait End quote. the satirical vein was always there quote, after listening to a long account of n s elaborate devices to avoid wounding the susceptibilities of her townspeople one remembered that after all neither he nor she are very popular it is one of the innumerable cases where le jeu ne vaut pas la jandelle and where in fact one burns the candle with hardly any jeu a lady caller wishing to convey a sufficient sense of some one's high social distinctions said to us you remember the baccarat scandal well she was one of the house party one can imagine the short story she would have made out of another trivial incident which is headed the hope luck mrs hope junior leaves box of best hats behind by mistake sisters-in-law wear same to hurlingham rain destruction exclamation of family just the hope luck End quote. dull people were not the same trial to her that they would have been to a less keenly observant nature yet she is rather hopeless about them if only they could discern that besides being miserably sinful they are also miserably dull they would at once be raised spiritually and perhaps incidentally intellectually also to a much higher level the following gives an idea of the notes she kept of scenes which might afterwards be useful Quote, meeting to form a temperance society january eighteen ninety nine mr w is invited to make financial statement well six and something is subscribed at door then he had books and cards to order so sent up fifteen shillings to the society but did not have things to that amount then there was the railway journey of the speaker from andover to hurstbourne return made a note of but unfortunately lost general discussion as to what it would be mr w recollects it was not to andover but to gradley solemn and significant ah as if the difference were enormous well then there are the books and there ought to be another bill but i'm afraid i don't know where it is and i can't make out this after puzzling ah yes i see some of the things were ordered for myself and some for mrs p so you see you add the three shillings sixpence and the six and something and it is all right vicar sadly i'm afraid i don't see unravelled by degrees that we have received six shillings seven pence and spent five shillings two pence satisfactorily but probably incorrect we end with a sally against lethargy of church from mrs p and regrets that vows taken against intoxicating drinks by young children cannot be made perpetual like baptismal vows End quote. the tie which connected mother and daughter was very close mrs hawker was a woman of the same vivid personality she shared her daughter's keen sense of humour and to the end of her life she was full of interest in all the topics of the day i am too ill to laugh now she said faintly to marie during a distressing attack but when i get better i shall describe to you the scene at my inquest looking through marie's diaries one gains an insight into what the parting from the beloved companion of all her life meant to the devoted daughter yet how strongly sorrow called forth her deep feelings of faith and resignation Quote, the remembrance of our times of most overwhelming grief she writes in nineteen o four becomes at last a comfort because the very depth of the suffering and the love that was its centre imply a depth and height which far transcends the compass of this little commonplace existence 
one feels that this dull round of petty cares and occupations and trivial talk cannot be the sequel to that tragedy no the curtain has fallen for a time and on either side we and the departed wait the drama's inconceivable and perfect climax there are seasons when the mind is so tense with the aspiration begotten of sadness that it reaches a kind of semi-consciousness of the life beyond and of the beloved who are there it is a little like our subconsciousness of the dear ones who are still on earth and yet invisible and distant i see only the view from my window with the autumn afternoon deepening over it i am dimly aware of much wider scenes and so too one is sometimes aware of the existence of the dear dead they seem to float like great intelligences fair in some vast firmament not merely unapproachable but inconceivable to human sense or fancy and yet in some way linked to us like the ether that enfolds the little street where i write and solar systems that are still undiscovered to-day the gentle and kindly minister of the presbyterian church spoke of god answering the fervent prayer for souls by saving those souls as if but for the prayers he would not have done it in fact was less merciful and loving than ourselves the theoretical basis of prayer must be rearranged perhaps as mere asking it may have to be renounced in any case if prayers have any effect it cannot be upon god i do pray i e ask for spiritual gifts for guidance especially but always with the conviction that i am formulating a desire stronger unutterably stronger in god than in myself and which he rejoices to see me share End quote. revisiting the old home in after years she recalls lovingly the summer evenings with the tea-table spread upon the terrace or the firelight talks in winter and then leaning over the churchyard gate looking towards her mother's grave she enumerates the old familiar features of the landscapes quote, highest of all in the distance the beech avenue it is evening a fine winter evening that makes a poem a picture veil after veil most cunningly drawn over all through which the copses become soft masses of feathery brown every tone of brown from that of a withered beech leaf to the hue of a leafless elm branch against a pale sky and purple dark indigo purple and a distance painted in cloudy blue the colour of the meadows is sad green the streams catch the light and shine like long narrow spears among them behind this low-lying picture is a great suspended sweep of sky all suffused with rosy pink the mystery the sadness the sweetness of it expressed by colours all subdued except in the sky beyond is wonderful only to be attained by winter and eventide together working the symbol perhaps of that old age in which all fierce desires and passions have burnt themselves out and only the glow of faith remains End quote. there is one grief about which little is breathed even in her inmost communings only here and there a stray word written half involuntarily alludes to the loss of that power of doing creative work which had been plucked away while she was still tasting all its charm but at the last as her mind and her pen dwell on the joy of heaven she adds a pathetic sentence quote, and then i shall not be sorrowful any more because i cannot write End quote. she would not let it spoil her life and even when crushed by sickness and bereavement she was not a sad or gloomy person in january nineteen o eight she writes quote, it would seem i shall not die but live if it be so i trust that it may be to serve others especially younger less experienced others in this rough world in such ways as shall be made plain by that kindly light on whose direction more and more implicitly i rely End quote. but she was not to live and six months later she was laid to rest in the picturesque little churchyard of lines hall in herefordshire Evelyn March Phillips. End of Lenoe Falconer, a biographical sketch 
by evelyn march phillips